we've heard about, obviously, you managed to convince Sebastian <laughs> to go for this in the office. How do you get around this for younger children who clearly aren't going to be able to lie on a bed and have a spinal infusion? They do amazingly well, really? I will tell you. Um, so, you know, for babies, uh, their parents want this for them because obviously they know that without treatment, they're going to lose their child. So I think it becomes a totally... Um, different conversation when we're dealing with uh, an infant. Um, for my older patients, so starting at the age of about three, um, I think my patients really start having much more of a conversation about this. I mean, I've mentioned that the brain is not negatively impacted. My patients are very bright. And so my three and four year old patients with SMA will say to me um, their opinions about what we're doing. But on the day, do you, do you always succeed in getting the patient to lie there to get the spinal tap, you never have to resort to sedation or anesthesia? So we started out with those three to five year olds um, trying some sedation. And what we found was that actually our patients really did not like the IV placement for the sedating medicine. We, they would prefer to be distracted. They will um, play music, as you know. Yeah. Uh, we like to jam out a little bit. Um, they can put on headphones. Many of them will play games on their phones or um, they'll watch TV through an iPad or they'll watch a movie. And um, I've had even my youngest patients tell me, three, four, five, that they would really rather me just do a very quick spinal tap and get it done with than have a bunch of IV pokes and the medication, which can make you feel nauseous afterwards. They don't want sedation. I do offer it if they would like it though. I mean it's amazing. We've heard about some of the real improvements that you can get from these treatments. When you're counselling parents and children about the risk of these treatments, what do you discuss? Obviously the procedure itself, a spinal tap, is, mm -hmm. is not child's play. Mm -hmm. um, do you g consent patients about the risk of the tap and mm -hmm. what the downsides of having these infusions? Yes, absolutely. So we talk about both the lumbar puncture risks and um, the risks of medication. And so with the lumbar puncture, we talk about things like um, infection, which is why it's done as a sterile technique. Uh, we talk about the risk technically of bleeding since I'm puncturing the skin, although I reassure them that the area that I'm going is not highly vascular. Um, we talk about the risk for post-lumbar puncture headache. That was my question. Mm -hmm. Although I use a um, extremely small needle, I use a 22 gauge for most of my patients, and I'm reasonably good at what I do, so there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, wiggling around, which would leave a big tear in the dura, which usually is the culprit of those spinal headaches. So my spinal headache um, incidence is incredibly low at this point. And after the spinal taps, were you straight back to normal living, or was there a period of 24 hours, 48 hours, or where you had to take it easy? Um, the first time, I did have a little bit of soreness, but after in that, the back, yeah. once you get it, it's just like, all right, I'm going to work. <laughs> Most so, of my patients will say, I've got to get back to school. Yeah. <laughs> so you've, not, you've never had any problems with headaches or um, any symptoms other than just local irritation from where the injection Yeah, me given. personally, I haven't had any symptoms. It's just, like you said, the, the lower irritation, like the first or the second time, that's about it. Now, we've heard that this disease is not common. When you're treating patients like Sebastian, who's a great advocate for other patients that have been through these kind of treatments, do you get patients to talk to each other to be advocates? Do you use people like Sebastian to egg on other okay. Patients I to wish. get treatment. Does it work like that? Oh, no. HIPAA kind of prevents me from doing that, although it is an incredibly small community. Um, so we actually have a muscular dystrophy association clinic, and um, there's a muscular dystrophy association camp. And actually, did you ever go to camp? I don't remember. I didn't go to camp. You didn't go to camp. I want to well, go to camp. you need to go back to camp. Okay. So uh, several of my patients actually knew each other from camp days, and so um, I would encourage them to reach out to each other. But I'm not technically allowed to connect patients one-to-one, -one. Um, although I'm really fortunate that groups like Cure SMA and, and there are some local Facebook groups that have um, allowed for a community to come together and to get corroboration about experiences through diagnosis and treatment, so that's been helpful. Sebastian, we yes. know that this is not a common disease, and yet when you're talking to specialists like Dr. Proud, it's what she does all day, every day. What's it like when you talk to other doctors who don't have the knowledge about this disease? Do you find that you're having to educate them on what's actually been 
going on with you? I would say yes, and I think Dr. Proud is very awesome with that. She gives you the rundown of everything, so when you do come to people that you need to have the dialogue with and explain stuff to, um, it's easier for them to understand and be able to know where to navigate their research towards. And uh, just to bring you back into the discussion, for patients like Sebastian who are interacting with doctors, maybe through college, they're a long way from home, they're potentially a long way from a centre of excellence. Do you give them advice on, you know, if you see other doctors, these are the kind of things that you need to warn them about? Absolutely. What are the kind of messages that you try and communicate about taking care of themselves when they're away from a centre of excellence? Absolutely. So some of the things that you've just alluded to, respiratory care is uh, incredibly important. Um, so we know that the, the recommendation is that these patients receive their annual influenza uh, vaccine. We give that in my clinic, but if for some reason they're uh, not do in clinic during the season, then I would recommend that they receive that at their primary care doctor's uh, visit, that they stay up to date on all of the other routine vaccinations to prevent uh, as much preventable disease as we possibly can since they're at higher risk of hospitalization if one of these diagnoses impacts them. Um, flu and pneumonia is incredibly different in a patient with SMA than someone who does not have SMA and can actually land them in the hospital in the intensive care unit. Um, and then likewise, when we're thinking about respiratory insufficiency and the risks that go along with that, making sure that if a patient has something that takes them either to the emergency room for emergency surgery or even for a scheduled surgery, that they need to be advocates to speak to their anesthesiologist about, hey, I have a motor nerve disease because that anesthesiologist may have a very different approach pharmacologically with them than they would someone else. Of course. 